Welcome to Apostles on Fire TV. Here you'll be getting powerful video clips that will steer you up for a glorious work with God. Enjoy the video. Thank you. I'll show you what the devil does to the mind of the believer, how he puts him under pressure to accept defeat. And you must understand that the first premise and the first theater of warfare is in your mind. And the devil is aware that it doesn't matter how powerful your call is and the allotment that are associated with it. If he can play with your mind, you will reject your goodness. You will accept a curse. Satan is always playing tricks on our minds. If, for instance, in the book of Second Kings, where I asked you to open, the Bible says that it came to pass as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, two measures of barley for a shekel and a measure of fine flour for a shekel shall, shall be tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. This is a prophetic word. This is what God is saying. But in the next verse, and the Lord answered the man of God and said, Now behold, if the Lord should make the windows in heaven, might such a thing be? God has spoken, and this man is questioned, that even if God should make windows in the heaven, how can these things be? <laughs> God, in the utterance that he gave, was attempting to take everybody in captivity out of his bounds. But there were men that were still bound in their minds such that when the word of liberation came out, the question, until we break the yoke that is on the mind, we will never mount up. Shall these things be? Why didn't the man keep quiet? He so believed that the only thing that was going to come out of the situation was captivity. Even though God has spoken a word that is bound to his integrity, the man said that if God were to open the windows of shall this thing. Once upon a time, someone came and I felt a witness in the Holy Ghost to help him in whatsoever he wants to do. That means the body of sourcing funds of making things happen was taken from him, but he was still bound. He couldn't imagine that that bondage, ah, in the height of my goodwill, he could not be helped. Because he was bound, he was trapped down. I could see the fetters, but the fetters were not physical chains. They were not cords. They were in the mind. And as long as he wears that mind, he can have a fine face, but he will labor as a slave. The Bible says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper, even as thy soul prosper. So the external prosperity that you can enjoy is dependent on the prosperity you enjoy in your soul. I've seen many people before that came for counseling. And if you attempt to take them out of their thinking box, and it is that thinking box that has confined them, made them limited, made them insufficient, and you begin to provoke them with a few questions, that will get them to think outside of that box and to consider the liberty that God is offering us in his word, suddenly they snap. Because they like their box. They like containment. But if God is going to change your story, he gives you an invitation. He said, come, let us reason together. Go out of your own space of thinking and think on my frequency. The moment your mind can capture it, the moment you are able to conceive it, it is a possibility. So if God needs to break a yoke, <laughs> The yoke is not totally broken if your mind cannot respond to the invitation that God is making available. If you cannot see what God is seeing, you cannot be at home with the ideas he's bringing into your mind. Oh my God, oh my God. One thing you must understand is that Satan will use every situation to harass your mind. Every situation. If someone dies in the family, Satan will use that death to harass your mind. He will try to paint a picture of how vulnerable you are and there is no need for you to strive because you are feeble. You can be taken out any time. He comes to preach around every scenario. But you see, the, the issue is this. We do not have a covenant with death. We have a covenant with life. Death has no power over us as long as we drink the water of purpose. It means that our time that death will have authority over us is not yet. And what the devil does is that he begins to steal into your mind so that you begin to lose grip on the significance 
for which God apprehended you in Jesus Christ. My Father in the Lord always says, and I quote, that destiny is stronger than death. And the reason why he says this, the, the depth or the origin of this quote, is that he is a minister of the gospel somewhere in northern Nigeria, and uh, he has been on the death list, the death list on several people that hate the labors of Jesus in the earth. He has been on their death list, and they have made attempts at his life at close range, and uh, every time he comes out without a scratch. So he postulated a theory. And what is the theory? Destiny is stronger than death. So if the devil can get to manipulate your mind so that your grip on destiny, your grip on your calling will begin to wane, then death can have authority in your space. So he will take advantage of every situation that takes place. Just in case you fall sick and you feel weak, he begins to whisper into your ears. And what he's trying to do is to make you give up from within. And if you yield to the pressure of his mind-bending tactics, you become a victim. Are you still with me? He will preach to you whenever you are financially down and you seem to be financially incapacitated. He will show up. Every situation whatsoever, every circumstance whatsoever that happens in your life that seems to be somewhat negative becomes a very good premise for the devil to storm your mind and begin to make his suggestion. And as he does it, he has this, this strange ability of resilience. He is so consistent and if you do not have the word of God in your vessel, you will believe the lie of the enemy. The thing about these arguments and reasonings that the devil brings our way is that they seem to exalt themselves over and above the authority and the place of the word of God in our life. So they are always trying to grow height. And the moment you consider the reasoning from the kingdom of darkness to be more valid than the word of God, you become trapped in the manipulation that the devil has in mind. So the Bible says that there is a deliberate activity that we must switch into to, to depose that authority, to reduce that authority to what it really is, which is nothing and nonsense. Through a process called casting down. Whereas casting out devils is instantaneous, casting down strongholds takes a process of time. That means it is something you will continue doing until you have reduced the height of that argument and it no longer stands in the way of your conviction. If you, if you allow it lie, if you sleep over it, you will become a victim. And you will tell stories like, like okay, like uh, there's a preacher, he said he had a, had a vision, an encounter in 1980. And he saw in the city of Ayangba an auditorium that was 30,000 seater. Hallelujah. And he was the pastor of that ministry that uh, had an auditorium that was what? 30,000 sitter. And uh, he wrote the prophecy in a journal, a very robust journal that was well secure. And he, anywhere there was a prayer meeting, he would go and read it out. That, oh, hear ye Israel. In your city, an auditorium will be built. And it's going to be 30,000 sitter. That is when he got the vision. He went to everywhere people prayed and he shared the mind of God. Then Satan now reminded him of his poverty. Have you ever? Hallelujah. There was one day Satan wanted to deal with me those days. I put two of my surviving trousers on the line. <laughs> and when I came back to the line, it was the good trouser was the one they stole. The one they left had a hole at a strange place. And then wind now blew it. As the wind blew the trouser like this, Satan spoke. I said, you see, <laughs> what is left? This is what is left of me. May you receive grace to cast, <laughs> to cast down. Satan, oh Jesus. Jesus Christ. Jesus. When the wind blew the trousers like this, he, he, he spoke. The sight was strange. And he said, oh, this is it. Satan knows the moment to puncture your faith. <laughs> if, if something happened to you, you were unfortunate and you got raped. And then when you were um, a young lady coming up, you were... 15 years old, you got raped. Satan will come and say, oh my. He will want to make you feel incapable. Want to make you feel rejected. Want to make you feel... So you see, he's building a case. 
And just like arguments are in the court of law, there is a tendency that you can believe him that you are good for nothing. Because he has defeated you in your soul, that which he has programmed into your life will begin to come to pass. But the Bible says, let God be true. And let every man be what? A liar. Our life is currently flowing in the direction of our strongest thoughts. The Bible says that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So it doesn't matter whether you are an anointed preacher, you are a powerful preacher, you are an expositor by excellence. Your life is going to flow in the direction of your strongest thought. And Satan is aware of this. And that's the reason why he wants to defeat you by setting up strongholds in your mind. If you wake me up from sleep and say, young man, where are you going? I'll give you, you will get tired of my presentation. You will get tired. Even in my sleep, I was thinking about it. My spirit was meditating on how hey, the avenues that we can exploit in order to promote. Uh, it, 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 Satan has lost it. In my case, he has lost it. He has, ah. There are such, there are people like us that Satan has lost on our case because there is no argument he can bring that can find a footing. No argument. And I'm not saying that uh, this is my disposition on a good day. My brother got kidnapped. And he died in captivity. After we had paid every ransom in millions. He collected the money. But they now called us that we should come and take the cops. I hope you know that's a nothing hot like that. And then you see your own brother's body dead in the forest. Ask my wife, I never shed a tear. Not because I am not, I wasn't emotionally attached to him. Because I know the scriptures. If you know the scriptures, you will never allow yourself to slip into a situation of excessive grief or excessive excitement. Are you there? You will stay in between. So if I have an alert of one billion, you will not know. Because I will not be excited. Do you understand? If that comes into my life, it means God is accelerating our mission. And you will see the effect of one billion naira on the field of mission. You will see the effect. Hallelujah. Are you, are you there? So yes, it was a situation of grief. But I didn't share the tear. Because I didn't want to give Satan an opportunity to preach to me. And the people that came, we, they came with the intention to comfort me. I quoted some scriptures and I discovered they were the ones that needed comfort. And we are still here. We have not broken down. I will never afford Satan that luxury of sitting down for him to be my preacher. To bend my mind and to plant in me philosophy that will injure my purpose, injure my destiny. Your life flows in the direction of your most predominant thought. You see, what anxiety does is that anxiety is designed to make you smile. Ah. Uh, so that you can, you will submit to Satan without a fight. Do not pray. So when the time for the expiration of your current rent is coming close, then anxiety will come into the picture. What anxiety will do is that it will show you a vision. A vision of where you are evicted from the house. And that that day rain will fall. As they are moving your, your luggage, your television, eh? anxiety will show you that the moment you got out on the street, Rain started falling. And your computer went bad. Your laptop went bad. Your iPad went bad. Your television went bad. And your Vita foam got soaked and became a coat of many colors. <laughs> That's what anxiety will show you. Anxiety will so make you afraid that you will submit in defeat even when Satan has not physically started fighting. So the object of anxiety is to bring you to a point of surrender. He said, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer. According to the NIV, according to uh, Philippians 4 verse 6, anything that is supposed to make you anxious is the same thing that should draw you to prayer. So the response to deficiency, deficits, insufficiencies should be prayer and not anxiety. The same things that should make you anxious as the same insufficiencies that should push you into prayer. He said, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Okay. 
you will think that in this prayer, when you are praying, are you there? There is a challenge, there is a need, and anxiety is hoping to take the stage and bring you into captivity, but you found prayer and you began to address the issues in prayer. You will think that after prayer, God will solve the problem that was opening the door to anxiety. That's not how God does it. Now, the next verse, let me show you how, how God does it. And the peace of God, the first thing that God does is that when you contact him, he now ministers peace into your heart. And according to the Bible, that peace is a burglary proof for your heart and your mind against anxiety. What he does is that he, he makes a proof, anxiety-proof situation by administering peace into your vessel. So what God did in this situation is not to change the situation, but to change you. Please help me tell your neighbor. Many times, God will not change the situation. What God will do is to change you by ministering peace, such peace that transcends all understanding. The Bible says, yeah, preach, preach. The Bible says, yeah, you see how difficult it is to preach? I'm telling you what to say and, and you are already over. The Bible says, it will guard your hearts and your minds. Hallelujah. So this peace that God is going to release from heaven is a burglary proof on your heart and a burglary proof where? On your mind. Because the arena from whence uh, uh, anxiety is born is in your mind. When people are anxious, they take steps that are not rational. When people are anxious, they surrender to the devil's uh, uh, intrigues even without exercising their faith. When people are anxious, they take upon themselves fetters and handcuffs and put on their hands and submit themselves bound to the devil. When Jesus, as God said, he was troubled in his spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. This word of knowledge. Someone is not listening to me. This scripture is one of the scriptures in the Bible that is an example of the manifestation of the gift of word of knowledge. They were just sitting together, eating together, and suddenly his spirit became troubled and, he, oh my God, he tried to decode why the Holy Ghost in him was troubled and then he decoded it, he discerned it, and he said it. There's one of you here that will betray me. Now, the reason why Jesus was able to pick this was because the conception of betrayal had already entered into that personality's heart. And why they sat at meat. Evangelist, I don't know if this has happened to you. You just sit amongst the people and you know their thoughts. It, it, it happens, to, not every time, but it happens to me sometimes. I, I just came into one place, I saw some brethren sitting down, and as I came into their knees, I just knew that it was me they were talking about in the past 45 minutes. I just knew. So I quietly stood up and gave them a parable so that they would know that I know. <laughs> Ooh, you know what? I like the Holy Ghost. Jesus was eating. And then the traitor that had begun to meet people behind the scene on how to betray him joined the fellowship. And his spirit was struck. And instantly he decoded and declared it. One of you here will betray me. I was thinking that this, uh, this supernatural revelation will strike a chord in the heart of his carrier. All right, next verse. Verse 22. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Next verse. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom he loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned on him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. So Peter knew that John was close to Jesus. I don't have time to talk about John. So he touched him. Why they were eating it? Find out. So John now uses his intimacy. You, a man that is intimate with God can always find out. God has no favorites. God only has intimates. The point is this. You will decide if you are God's intimate. And if indeed you are, you will find out. I went for a meeting somewhere and the people in the meeting came to me and said, we know you have a relationship with God. I didn't know. I, I, I did. I didn't know. So we know. We are well. So because you have a relationship with God, can you go back and find out 
what is about to happen here and come and tell us. Hallelujah. That was a great responsibility. So what I did was that I didn't come home. I went and took a room in a hotel and I was rolling on the ground, begging. I would roll on the ground. I would beg. And I did that for how many hours? For about eight hours, rolling on the ground. And the eight hours took me to like 3 a.m. in the morning and then Jesus now shows. The one that is intimate can always find out. But that's not where I'm going. So Peter began to beckon on John. Uh, he then, lying on Jesus' breast, said unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered and said, He it is to whom I shall give sup when I have dipped it, and when he had dipped the sup, the sup, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, and after the sup, Satan entered into him. First of all, it began as a thought. Secondly, that thought became an opener. And Satan did what? Whenever Jesus wants to wants my attention, what he does is that he triggers either a thought or some feeling. There's a certain feeling that if I feel, I know that God wants to speak to me. And that feeling can be on me for three days until I find a secluded place to pay attention to the emphasis that the Lord wants to bring. Then he begins to speak clear. So Satan was able to reach Judas Iscariot through his thoughts and that thought began to grow. It became an opening and then a spirit now had access to dominate him, to direct him, to instruct him. And you know, we said that our warfare is not in the context of flesh and blood, but we are at war with persons without bodies. So when we talk about persons without bodies, they have the ability to speak. The person should be able to speak. The person should have an opinion. The person can exercise his will. All right? So these persons without bodies, their entry point and the stranglehold of dominion that they set in the hearts of men is in form of thoughts. When those thoughts are intensified, those thoughts begin to migrate higher than the authority of the word of God in your membrane. And at that point, Satan is at liberty to call the shots and to drive the steering wheel. So in the case of Judas Iscariot, that was what happened. What needs do, do, do people have these days? Okay, house rent, house rent. All right, this is my pulpit. The name of my pulpit is called house rent. And maybe your house rent is almost due. You see, it's not polite for me to ask how many people here are in a situation where your house rent is almost due. So no, I won't go there. Hallelujah. So my pulpit is house rent. So your house rent is almost due. And because your house rent is almost due, you have looked around and there is no solution in sight in terms of how you are going to renew the house rent. And that deficit becomes the hole in your armor that anxiety cashes in from. God wants to be in possession of your mind. He wants to activate your mind so that you can have the capacity to think his thoughts. But as powerful as your mind is, because if God does not get you to conceive what he intends to do, uh, you, you can't even exercise faith for it. So part of the things that occasions uh, faith being furnished in your heart is that God speaks directly to you by proceeding word that is issued from his mouth. This proceeding word can come in terms of, in form of a voice. It can come in form of a picture that God puts before your face in a vision or in a dream. What God is trying to do is to take you outside of your own operating box and to show you something that is beyond the scope of the current limitation that you function in so that you can exercise your faith to migrate. The mind is a powerful asset, but just as it is an asset to God, it can also be an asset to them. I was on a mission trip to the United Kingdom, and I had the privilege of counseling with um, um, a British lady. In fact, the moment she came into my office, the first thing she said was, Pastor, am I cursed? I said, sit down. Who told you you are cursed? Then she gave me a story of herself, and she said, these things are symptoms of curses and all of that. So she finished saying everything. And then my duty was to move her 
from the place where the stronghold had bind, bound her. She was bound. We started, started educating the lady, educating the lady. Then I prayed with the lady. I told her the meaning of the prayer and the significance of the prayer. And instantly, there was a movement in her mind. She no longer believed she was cursed. And that was a great feat to accomplish in 45 minutes. Because you, sometimes you might need 45 days. But if you can't get the person to migrate in the thoughts, and your life flows in the direction of your most predominant thoughts, that your time of counseling was wasted. In order to keep in touch with her, I gave her my cell phone number. I said, you don't call this number, just send me WhatsApp messages about your progress. Two weeks later, she sent all the courses again. I said, ah! I saw Satan was walking over time. If Satan has been able to keep you in bondage in your mind, he doesn't need to even come and attack you in the night. He already measured. He uses your adornment, your potential to adorn his kingdom. You are no longer a threat. All he needs to do is to send the spirit called fear to intimidate you enough in the night. And then when you wake up, you just, you even say, sorry, sorry. Thank you for watching. Do well to subscribe, like, share the video to your loved ones so they can receive what God is doing from this platform. You can also follow us on all our social media platforms. We are on Instagram, we are on Facebook, and we are on Twitter. Thank you.